Hello, art historians, and welcome to another edition of AP Daily Live Review. My name is Allison Napier, and I'm coming to you live from Portsmouth, Virginia, uh, where it's a little bit cool today. We had it in the 70s, and then a cold front came through and some weather, but uh, still kind of a nice night for us here in the East Coast, uh, at least in my part of the world. So I hope you're having another great night on your end as well. We're going to get started. Uh, so I want to address some of the questions coming in the Google form. Uh, do we really need to know all 250 works? Uh, well, they are all part of the required content. Uh, I know that it's been kind of a wonky year. So if you're finding yourself maybe um, kind of feeling the pressure of getting all 250 in, I would encourage you to focus on contextual variables and kind of putting them in groups and reviewing them that way. Uh, what kinds of material about each piece should we know? Form, function, content, and context. Those are always the big variables that we talk about uh, with uh, works of art in the image set. Those are the things that you're going to have to discuss. And tonight we're going to be working with visual and contextual analysis a little bit more. Uh, we've talked about it the last two nights, but I wanted to review it tonight to make sure you kind of understood what that kind of evidence might look like uh, when you were picking it up when you're kind of picking it for your bigger essays or when you're trying to do a visual and contextual analysis of a work uh, in the exam. All right, so what specific, how specific should the complexity and analysis be? What are some topics complexity can be based off? Okay, so that's your question. And, and I, you know, again, this idea of how, eliciting a response in a specific context, things like uh, Turner's displaying the slave ship in conjunction with that meeting of the abolitionist conference, hoping that they would see it uh, and be influenced by it, or Velasco's work showing up at a World's Fair to promote an image of what it meant to be Mexican and this new uh, Mexican nation. Uh, we can talk about a more specific discussion of the artist's body of work. Uh, you may remember may remember from night one, we talked about Caravaggio's mature work and how uh, the calling of St. Matthew fit into that group of paintings um, from that later uh, period in his uh, career. We can talk about alternate perspectives. And last night I showed you that example with Thomas Cole's The Oxbow, where some people are saying he's arguing pro-manifest destiny. Other scholars are saying he's arguing against. So you can always uh, pick the other side of the argument uh, and, and use that to get you to complexity. If you were talk, you know, if you went, he's pro-manifest destiny, then for complexity, you could say, but some people think he's anti-manifest destiny, for example. How accurate do we have to be with the date? So we talked a little bit about this last night. Uh, if you're finding specific dates are kind of uh, giving you uh, trouble or they're a little bit tricky, uh, that's one of those things that, again, think about using early 1900s, late 1900s, and, and trying to uh, instead of nailing 1836, early 1900s, then maybe group works together uh, in those same time periods to kind of give you little associations that might help. Could we get a deeper look into African, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, et cetera, religions? Uh, and these are your questions, so I'm just kind of copying them and pasting them in. Uh, so uh, we will touch on some other faith traditions throughout the, this week and next week. Uh, how we package that uh, is a little different depending on the types of questions we're looking at, uh, but that we will talk on some works from some other other units. I realize we've been a little bit Eurocentric so far, but I'm getting ready to break the, break us out of that tonight. How long should your responses to FRQs 1 and 2 be? Do they need to be multi-paragraph essays or would a paragraph of 10 to 15 sentences be sufficient? You're going to hate this answer. Uh, really, whatever it takes to get the job done. I've seen very succinct essays written that are uh, 10 to 15 sentences. I've also seen four-page essays that uh, do a beautiful job. I've seen four-page essays that don't meet all the task points. So it's really whatever it takes just to get that information out there. Always take your prompt and check it back against what you've written and make sure you've answered everything you were asked. A couple more of your questions. Uh, is there going to be a part of the test where, the, where more than two identifications on an artwork will be needed to get a point? It's always two in addition to what you are given. So there won't be something that says you've got to give three for this question. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about identification before uh, we leave this slide. But let me go ahead and uh, kind of answer the rest of the questions here. And then I'll uh, address the identifying uh, factors that you need to think about. If a painting has a story, can explaining that story be the complexity point? 
Well, generally, that's part of the content that you're wrestling with in the essay already. And for that complexity point, again, you want to say something new. So telling the narrative of the work that's probably already been addressed at some point in that essay. So it's probably not going to get you the complexity that you need to score that last task. For the essay questions, I think College Board mentioned that they wouldn't have any identifying factors for the digital exam. However, I realized that in the videos, you said that for both the digital and traditional exam, the identifying questions will come up. I was a little bit confused, so it would be awesome if you could clarify that, and I do want to clarify that. Uh, but let me show you this last little bullet first, and then I will talk about this um, issue of identifying on the digital exam. So here is the link to your AP Art History exam information uh, that tells you all about the format, the layout of the questions. Uh, and you, uh, you can get to this very simply by just Googling AP Art History exam 2021. But I did put this link up here because some of the questions I keep getting in the Google form are answered on this site. And so my, if you haven't seen this uh, in class, uh, take a look at it uh, and make sure that you read through what to expect on the exam and the different type of tasks. It actually has a whole section on the digital exam. I think we'll clear up some of the questions uh, that people have. Now let's talk about this identifying information question. As for identifying the works of art in the free response questions, this is really my best take on uh, what you need to do on the digital version of the exam. So when answering an FRQ for the digital exam, you're still going to have to identify the work you're discussing, okay? Uh, as an exam reader, if I get your essay, I've got to know what you're talking about. So you can't just say something like, oh, the image of the Virgin Mary. Well, there are several of those in the image set. We have the Chart Virgin Mary in stained glass. We have the Rook in Pieta. We have the Virgin of Guadalupe. Uh, again, if you picked an image outside of the set, I need to know what Virgin are you talking about? Which Mary are we talking about? So that's not going to be something that you can just throw that in there and keep on going. So you've got to identify what you're talking about. You can't just talk about the landscape in the image set or the still life in the image set. We've got a ton of those. Uh, or the artist self-portrait. Again, we've got several artist self-portraits. So you do need to name the work uh, and clarify what you're discussing. Now, let's say you give something like Las Meninas. OK, well, that would pretty much identify the work without too many additional identifiers. I always think it's good practice to go ahead and give the two. Um, but, you know, with that, that works. But if you think if you start describing what Las Meninas is instead of giving the title and you say something like the portrait with the artist and the group of people in it, again, We've got another couple of works with artists in them, self-portraits, right? And then we've got the Kirchner work, for example, that has another person in it. So identifying the work is not something you really get around on the digital exam. It's just, uh, you know, because you have, you're taking it digitally, um, you know, you need to be specific so we know what you're talking about. But, you know, it, it's a little bit, uh, because you have access to, the computer, um, you may not, you know, if you use Las Meninas, you, you should be in, in the big picture okay. Um, if you talk about Las Meninas, like I said, and if it says to give additional identifiers on the exam, I haven't actually seen one of the digital exam questions, then that's what you've got to do, okay? Uh, so really, what does the prompt tell you to do should be what's guiding your, your discussion here. Um, now, also, if you go off, off list, and let's say you pick something like Monet's Water Lilies or uh, Van Gogh's Self-Portrait or Rembrandt's Self-Portraits or Turner's Landscapes, uh, make sure you tell me which one we're talking about. If, you're, if it's a self-portrait of Van Gogh, he did about two, one, a couple of those a year in some cases. Uh, so make sure you maybe give a date uh, so I know which one you're talking about if possible to help clarify. Again, the College Board site says also students will not be asked to provide identifying information for works of art and free response questions. But again, clearly you have to identify the work being discussed so that the person scoring your essay knows what you're talking about. We can't accurately analyze your response unless we have a clear feel for what you're discussing. So that's the best answer I can give you pretty much on identification. There's not a way around it because you've got to tell me what you're writing about. Now, a couple other feedback things. Um, 
Some of you guys, just uh, some of you guys uh, gave me some kudos. I do appreciate that. I won't read all of those. Uh, and then it says maybe include an example of a poorly done FRQ to show what to avoid. That is a good uh, suggestion, maybe for future sessions. Uh, keep in mind that you do have the um, the sample student responses in the Google Drive for you to take a peek at. Uh, so you can see some that don't score sixes and fives and fours. You can see some that score a little bit on the lower end and where they're, they're missing the mark. Speaking of the Google Drive and the Google feedback form, uh, here are the links for those. Some of you wrote in, you were having problems with the tiny URL link. So I gave you the whole, um, the whole Monty here of the, the long link. Uh, so if you had problems with the tiny URL, here's another uh, version of the access points. All right, so let's get started. So in this AP Daily Live Review session, we're going to review art and architectural forms from the image set created in uh, the geographic region identified generally as Latin America, uh, the Americas, um, but particularly uh, the kind of pre-contact uh, in Central Mexico uh, and the colonial contact zone. So we're going to be looking uh, at this is the area of in and around Mexico and, and what it looked like before colonization and then how colonization impacted it and what those visual and contextual elements were. And so visual and contextual analysis skills we'll be looking at. Uh, we're gonna consider how these works demonstrate cultural interaction between the Europeans and the indigenous, indigenous American groups in that region. And then we're gonna examine the mixing of styles and traditions and forms and media and the art objects that are unique to this region because of this kind of cultural clash. So let's talk a little bit about visual and contextual analysis. So these are some of the entry level skills, right? Visual analysis is skill one, contextual analysis is skill two. Uh, visual analysis is the starting point for art historians. Uh, this is what we begin with. We start by identifying the work of art, uh, describing the visual elements that were used uh, to create it, uh, how artistic decisions shape the work. But this is only our first step. It's called art history. So we have to take historical context into this uh, into consideration and think about how the art reflects the time period in which it was created, uh, how it was received in its time period. And so there are a lot of different details that we look at. Uh, to see how uh, these things, how context affects a work. It could be political variables, uh, social variables. In some cases, uh, when we know more about artists and who they are in their biographies, it can be personal um, issues going on in an artist's life that affect context or struggles that they may have had or things that interest them or have historically affected their cultures. So the contextual variables not only the original time and how the events affect um, things, but the visual variables, all of these work together as we start building our analyses. So we have um, skill one. Again, we take a peek at this just to remind us what we're working with, uh, identifying the work of art. So, you know, any of the fields that we talk about that are a lot of this information given in the CED, name of artist, culture of origin, style, materials. Uh, describing visual elements of a work, the form, the style, the materials, the technique, the content, uh, and how the decisions made by artists, right, about these things shape the work. We also talk about contextual analysis skills, um, describing the contextual events um, and, and elements of a work, uh, the function, its context, its physical location or citing uh, subject matter, how it was received, uh, the intent and purpose, how that affects the creation of the work. Uh, why is the context affecting what we're seeing? Okay, so it's one thing to identify the context and describe it. It's another thing to explain how it actually impacts the work. And then how artistic decisions uh, elicit a response or shape its reception. How do people receive the work after it's been created? So let's get started and kind of look at this a large example of a um, visual and contextual analysis process. And we're going to, I say a large example because we're really looking at a little bit of an extended period of time here as we start to take on the Latin American contact zone. Now, a scholar named Mary Louise Pratt, she's actually a literary scholar, 
termed the or coined the term contact zone. And this was a term she used to describe places where cultures meet and clash and kind of grapple it out with each other. Uh, often these are areas where we have asymmetrical power relations, uh, colonialism, uh, slavery, aftermaths of either of those can be factors in a contact zone. So with this definition, we can certainly assert that Latin America during its colonial period was a contact zone where the Spanish culture met clashed and grappled with indigenous groups who had been living here for centuries prior to their arrival. And so with Latin America during the colonial period, it's a contact zone uh, that extends a, a very vast region. So we, we're going to focus again more on the area of central, Mex of central uh, Mexico and, and, and Central America versus South America. I'm going to let you wrestle with that a little bit tonight for homework. So let's start by looking at some of the indigenous cultures in this region. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at the Maya first, uh, who are precursors to the Mexico or the Aztecs that we'll talk about, um, that will be the culture that meet the Spanish. So Yaxchitlan, located in Chiapas, Mexico, which is close to the border of Guatemala, uh, is a site that had an has an impressive number of structures and monuments still remaining, about 100 left at, or 100 at its peak and very famous for its high quality relief carvings. So we're going to take a little bit of a look and do some visual and contextual analysis of these relief carvings uh, from the site. And you see the images here. Um, you have uh, lintel, you have number 24. Five, I believe in the image set and then structure 33. Uh, so we're, but I threw in uh, uh, 25, I threw in an extra lintel just so we could kind of create a sense of narrative as to what's going on here um, and a little bit more developed discussion. So let's take a look um, and you'll see some of the elements that we need to talk about as we talk about these lintels before our visual and contextual analysis skills. So one, this is pretty much a dominant form of sculpture and relief carving at Yaxchilan, this lintel, uh, which is, again, these are positioned uh, in protected positions above door frames. We talk about post and lintel construction in our course, uh, you know, making those kind of basic framing of openings. Many of these lintels survive with a lot of exceptional detail intact. Uh, and that, you know, these slightly private locations suggest that these lintels might have been used for more varied subject matter. And each surviving lintel has been numbered by archaeologists. So you're seeing 24 and 25, uh, which are the ones that interest us here. Uh, they are located above, above the door frames on structure 23. And this building was built to mark the refounding of the city under Shield Jaguar II. And the lintels served as these kind of sacred mythical precedents that authorized and legitimized his rule and that of his dynasty. And so this was considered to be, this building structure 23 was the Yotot or the Royal House of the Queen. And she's featured in both of these images. So when we talk about what's culturally important and we're talking about context and contextual burials, bloodletting is a very common ritual among the elites and it's a very frequent subject in Mayan art. The ruler or another elite, include, including women, would let blood to honor and feed the gods uh, at a dedication ceremony of a building when children were born and other important occasions. Rulers needed to shed blood in order to maintain order in the cosmos. And so the ruler was believed to be a descendant of the gods. And the act of bloodletting was critical in maintaining their power and order in the community. Uh, bloodletting was considered an act related to rebirth and rejuvenation. And so you see here in Lintel 24, the actual bloodletting ritual, Shield Jaguar is dominating the scene here on the left. We see him standing uh, over his wife, Lady Juk. Uh, and so this ritual function, he's really, even though he seems to dominate, he's really kind of the assistant to his wife. Uh, he's got this flaming torch that illuminates the scene and suggests that this might've taken place at night. Uh, the text, these glyphs that you see here, give us some, some information that help us again establish context and content and what's going on uh, and the, the give also a date in here that corresponds to the evening of October 28th AD 709. 
Now, lentil 25, we see Lady Shook dressed in these fine garments, decorated with flower motifs, uh, bearing a basket of blood-soaked papers, along with a serpent bar dedicate, decorated with a skull in her hands. And she gazes upward with this kind of shamanic intensity at this vision that she's conjured. Uh, at her feet, we see that basket of papers. And from this, we have a double-headed vision serpent emerging, winding its way up the visual side of the lintel before opening the jaws of the upper head to reveal uh, Yot Balam, who was the first seated lord, the ancestral founder of the Yaxchulan royal line. Uh, and so the lower jaws, the lower jaws have the standard representation of Chak, uh, the Mayan storm god. So there's a lot going on here visually that we can read. Uh, we can talk about um, the content and the subject matter, uh, the use of bloodletting, its function again it serves as um, a decorative component it re this mythical precedent that reauthorizes and authorizes the legitimacy of the royal line uh, we can talk about form materials and technique these are relief images carved from stone so as we think about visual and contextual analysis uh, we're, this is really kind of the basic uh, understanding of the works that we've been given From visual and contextual analysis, of course, we build our other skills. We start comparing works of art. We can talk about attribution. We can talk about different interpretations and scholarship. But again, visual and contextual analysis are what really are the cornerstones of the work we do as art historians. Now, as we kind of transition into this uh, period where we uh, are just pre-contact with the Mexica uh, or the Aztecs coming to dominate central Mexico, their base of power in the Lake Texcoco region. We talked a little bit about this area last night when we talked about the Velasco painting. And the Mexica uh, claimed to be descended from the royal Toltec lines. They adopted a lot of aspects of Toltec culture, including the worship of Quetzalcoatl uh, and human sacrifice. Uh, Aztec rulers frequently sent out teams of workers to ruin Toltec cities, uh, especially the city of Tula, to bring back works of art and sculpture. Uh, we think they know that the Aztecs themselves, the Mexica, originated from a nomadic tribe in northern Mexico, arriving in Mesoamerica beginning around the 13th century. Uh, and then they settle in Tenochtitlan, uh, and they emerge as this dominant force in central Mexico and develop a very intricate political, social, and religious organization, a commercial organization that brings together a lot of different city-states under their control by the 15th century. So we, this is kind of the rise of the Aztec empire, the beginnings um, and, and the expansion that we see from these people. So just to give you a sense of kind of con geographic context where they're located. In the center, right, of everything, the capital of the empire, Tenochtitlan, founded in the early 14th century, uh, we have, of course, this complex of, uh, the city, which was quite expansive, a sacred precinct at the heart of the capital city containing about 50 separate structures uh, surrounded by a wall uh, that was meant to kind of, you know, with uh, covered in snake relief carvings known as the Coata Pantil uh, or Pantli, uh, which is the serpent wall. And inside of this kind of sacred precinct, we have some of the most important sites of the Aztec Empire, uh, the Templo Mayor, uh, which encompasses the temples of Tlaloc and Huitzilopochtli, the Eagle's House, the Pyramid of Tezcatlipoca, uh, the Gladiator Sacrifice Stone, uh, the Skull Rack or the Saint Pantli, and then we have an I-shaped ball court, uh, the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, and several other uh, important structures. We're going to focus on the Templo Mayor, which is in your image set. Uh, it rises about 90 feet and covered in stucco. It is, it's got several uh, different phases to it because every new uh, ruler comes in and expands it to show their reign, the kind of the start of their reign and expands the temple. So uh, it get, you know, it, it's kind of, we can see the different shells here of those different layers that get added to it over time. It always has these two grand staircases um, that to access the twin temples at the top, which were dedicated to Tolak, the god, the rain, the deity of rain and water, uh, also asso associated with agricultural fertility, and Huitzilopochtli, who was the patron deity of the Mexica or the Aztecs, uh, and associated with warfare, fire, and sun. 
So let us take a little bit more of a look at the Templo Mayor. And, and again, when we talk about the things we need to be addressing with visual and contextual analysis, form, materials, technique, uh, that's all about visual, uh, content and subject matter, uh, that's more about, um, again, identification, context, physical sighting, function, that's when we kind of start to look at the contextual analysis. So the Templo Mayor, 180 feet um, foot high pyramid platform with these two flights of stairs on the western side heading up to the summit with the twin temples. The whole structure faced with lime plaster, very brightly painted. Uh, it was the scene of state occasions uh, and coronations, the place of countless human sacrifices where the blood of the victims was thought to feed and appease the great gods uh, that it was the temples were dedicated to. Uh, between 1325 and 1519, when Cortez arrives, the Templo Mayor gets expanded, enlarged, and reconstructed during seven different building phases. Again, these correspond to different rulers or Tlatuanis or speakers that take office in the new construction usually kind of because of the change of, of power, the change of ruler, but also environmental problems could cause uh, some of this to have happened, such as flooding. So the north side shrine is dedicated to the god of rain. Um, Tlaloc on the south side, we have uh, Huitzilopochtli's temple, the god of war. Uh, Tlaloc marks the summer solstice, the symbolic um, wet season, right? Uh, so, and the Huitzilopochtli marches, marks the summer, goodness, the winter solstice or the symbolic, um, kind of symbolic of the dry season, which is the time for warfare. So Huitzilopochtli's temple also symbolizing Coatepec or Serpent Mountain, which is one of the most sacred places in uh, Mexica mythology and religion. The name comes from the native language of Nahuatl, uh, words like Coatl serpent and Tepetl mountain give us Coatepec. And uh, we know that Tlaloc, that's for which Lepochli side that speaks to the violent birth of this deity. Uh, Tlaloc's temple probably meant to symbolize the mountain of sustenance or Tonat Tonacatapetl, which uh, was a fertile mountain pr that produced high amounts of rain and allowed crops to grow. And so paired together, these two deities symbolize the Mexica concept of burnt water, or which connoted warfare, which was the primary way that the Mexica really acquire power and wealth, as well as humans for sacrifice to appease the gods. So these monumental steps um, also painted blue and white representing for Tlaloc's temple representing the colors of water. Uh, Huitzilopochtli's painted bright red to symbolize blood and war. So when we talk about these, um, we talk about, of course, the form and the structure, uh, that these are stone pyramids, the staircases, the use of plaster, the use of paint, all of those materials are important. They carry meaning and, and add, uh, uh, information about the work in our analysis. Uh, we talk about the content and the subject matter with the symbolism of the temples, the physical sighting at the center of the Aztec empire, the Mexica empire, the center of the capital. And this idea that functionally, this was a, uh, a place where state occasions took place. Now in 1519, Cortes arrives and uh, the Spanish, you've got to realize, are veterans of a long struggle in another contact zone, that of Spain. Uh, we talk about Isabella and Ferdinand uh, fighting uh, to regain control of Spain um, from the caliphate. Uh, and so we've, we, we've talked about other works uh, from the Spanish contact zone, like the Great Mosque of Cordoba, which is in your image set. Cortes uh, and, and, and the conquistadors, they're used to, again, the struggle of a contact zone, and they're known for conquering uh, the Mexica and claiming Mexico on the behalf of Spain. Uh, Cortez will serve as a soldier first in Cuba, led by Diego Velasquez, and then he will uh, end up moving on to Mexico on his own, overthrowing Montezuma in Tenochtitlan, and the Aztecs will eventually um, they will push back against the Spanish, but ultimately the Spanish will defeat them in 1520. So it takes a couple of years before Spanish control sets itself up. And once it does, it then becomes something called the Vice Royalty of New Spain. And in the Vice Royalty of New Spain, the Catholic Church uh, is very important, if not the most important patron of the arts. Uh, we talk about the commissioning of churches and altarpieces, paintings, sculptures, all as a result of a royal patronage uh, that granted the Spanish crown really unprecedented privileges in church affairs. 
in exchange for Spain's funding of the missionary ventures of the Catholic Church abroad. So the colonization of New Spain really worked in favor of both the Spanish crown's imperialist uh, aspirations and material aspirations, as well as the Catholic Church's desire to evangelize the local indigenous populations. So as for the Templo Mayor, that will be raised. It will be um, following the Spanish conquest. The Aztecs had used it as a rallying point and defended it very vigorously during the conquest. Uh, and then ultimately a Christian cross had been placed on top of it. And it was gradually torn down, built over and disappeared uh, beneath uh, 19th century colonial buildings uh, and, and other structures that are built on the site. Again, when usually when colonizers come in, uh, they, they take the symbols and of importance and power and, and cultural identity of the cultures that they're taking over and either co-opt them or eradicate them. Now, I tend to mix these images up when I teach them in the image set. So this is actually, uh, so we've seen a couple of things from unit five. Uh, now we're gonna look at a couple of things from unit three. Yeah, unit three. Um, so this is the Codex Mendoza, which was believed to have been created around 1541. Uh, and it contains a history of Aztec rulers and their conquests, as well as a description of the daily life of pre-conquest Aztec society. So we have the rendering of Aztec operators who want to attack the rebel city. Um, in the extra image I have, the one you have from the image set is the frontispiece. And so Around 1541, so Spanish have been there about 20 years at this point, the first viceroy of New Spain, Antonio de Mendoza, commissions a codex to record information about the Aztec Empire. And so the codex, which is known as the Codex Mendoza, contains a lot of information about the lords of Tenochtitlan, the tribute that was paid to Aztecs by the people who were under their sphere of influence, and an account of life from year to year. And so the artists were indigenous and the images here often annotated in Spanish by a priest that spoke Nahuatl, which was again the native language of the ethnic group to which the Aztecs belonged. And Viceroy Mendoza, his intention in commissioning this work is to send it to the Spanish king, Emperor Charles V, but it never makes it there. French pirates acquire it and it ends up in France and then it gets acquired by André Thévé, who is cosmographer to King Henry II of France, uh, so you'll see his name on a couple of pages in here, um, including on the top of the front and the top um, area of the frontispiece. So it's got a kind of interesting uh, context, like story about its context, right? That it, it gets taken by pirates and ends up in France rather than the intended audience. And that's not necessarily uncommon of this period, uh, that things don't always end up where, that, where they are intended to go because of uh, maritime uh, inter interference. So image you have in the set, again, is the frontispiece, and it's from a codex, which comes from the Latin word uh, meaning tree trunk or book, uh, which, again, we talk about things being formed out of wooden tablets. And this, uh, this kind of idea of bookmaking, um, the earliest form of the book, the Codex Mendoza, is really a spectacular example of one of these early Aztec codices or Mexica codices that go back to Europe. So, it's painted on European paper bound in a European style, but the pictures are drawn and painted in the style of the region by members of the Aztec people. The inscriptions written in Spanish by a Spanish priest uh, who spoke Nahuatl, so he was able to ask questions about the pictures that the indigenous artist drew in order to provide very clear explanations for the emperor in Spanish. So you, again, this is one of these works of a contact zone where we have uh, both Spanish and indigenous um, groups working together or, or language speakers working together, artisans working together uh, to create one unified work. The first page uh, shows the founding of Tenochtitlan, which you see here um, on the island of Lake Texcoco. Uh, the Mexica tribe or the Aztecs, again, as we know them, would find the eagle sitting on the cactus growing out of a stone and that that would tell them um, that when they are the god Huitzilopochtli tells them when they find this that this is where they should build their city and so actually the um, Tenochtitlan translates as place of the prickly pear cactus so you get this schematic diagram of the city which is divided into four parts um, by these intersecting blue and green uh, diagonals 
that represent the canals that divided that actually did divide the city into four quarters. Uh, so we have, um, we see this kind of coordination with the four cardinal points. We've seen that in other cultures uh, like the ancient Near East and Egypt uh, in this image here. And in, in this work, we see uh, people surrounding the eagle, the 10 founders of the city. Uh, the figure directly to the left is Tanuk. He has a uh, gray flesh. He's right there. Uh, and the, he's the Lord from that the city was named after. And so all of these figures and symbols in the frontispiece, they really relate to the city's foundation and the early history of the empire. Uh, we have uh, the skull rack. We have the eagle um, on the structure that symbolizes a temple, maybe the Temple of Mayor. Uh, we have a war shield. We have corn and other types of plants, again, referring to agricultural fertility of the culture and, and the empire as well. So lots of things we can talk about here with this as far as form, materials, and techniques uh, for visual analysis, content, and subject matter, what's going on. Uh, and then, of course, the context, it's commissioning, it's not making it to its intended audience, uh, you know, but the whole reason that this is created is to really give Charles kind of an insight as to what these new lands he now possesses uh, have to offer, what's their story. Now, kind of connecting across the curriculum, we can see here uh, Montezuma's feather headdress. Uh, we see those green feathers. Those are very valuable. They were part of the tribute that came from some of the cultural groups. We also see figures wearing these green plumed headdresses uh, here as well. We can talk about the actual actual figural forms. Um, so visual analysis will allow us to make connections between the application of visual elements in these early indigenous cultures and how they're showing up in the Codex Mendoza, which is created by indigenous artists. So some of the figures here are in composite view, uh, like our dismembered coil Shalqui stone, uh, as well as profile view. We also get the glyphs worked into some of these texts as well, uh, and the use of text, even though it might be Spanish, uh, giving us a sense of what's happening in these uh, on these pages. So figural forms, very similar in many ways, and, and that kind of tradition of representation of humans uh, carrying forward. Forward. With the Spanish colonization of the Americas, the devotion to the Virgin Mary crosses the Atlantic and Hernan Cortez wears an image of the Madonna and brings, brings images of her with him um, as he searches for gold and encounters the indigenous peoples of Mexico. And so once we have the Viceroyalty of New Spain established, uh, the Virgin Mary becomes a very popular theme for artists. And then eventually uh, we will have a manifestation, a unique manifestation of the Virgin Mary in the Americas, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, who you see here, uh, also called the Guadalupana uh, by uh, Mexicans today. Her image is found everywhere throughout Mexico today. It's on churches, chapels, homes, restaurants, vehicles, even tattooed on human bodies. There's, all, there's candles, there's, there's all sorts of uh, tchotchkes you can buy with the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And over 20 million people visit the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe each year, uh, which is situated on the very same hill where she appeared to Juan Diego, which of course is in that Velasco painting we talked about last night. In 1990, uh, John, Pope John Paul II uh, visits Mexico and beatifies Juan Diego as a saint as well. So millions travel to see her to gl glimpse an original, to see the actual original image, which this is not. Uh, and they actually, it actually is like a conveyor belt, a moving sidewalk where you zoom past it uh, because there's the traffic is so heavy to get to see her uh, every, you know, with tourism every, every day of the year. So, in the four corners of this painting, we see four framed scenes uh, carried by angels. These show the different moments in the story of the miracle of the Virgin of Guadalupe. We see uh, Juan Diego, uh, she, she's surrounded again by these apparitions of, and Juan Diego, an indigenous man, the moment when he unveils her image and his tunic to the bishop. Uh, we see uh, him encountering her, the flowers uh, falling out. So all of these different scenes in this mythology portrayed here in these different corners. Uh, some of the most remarkable images ever created of her are not entirely in paint, but in what we see here, which is in Conchado. And so we have Miguel Gonzalez's virgin, version of the Virgin here. Uh, and she's shown on 
you know, his on the cloak of Juan Diego the Tilma, uh, this kind of three quarter view, crowned, hands clasped, eyes downcast, um, encased in light on a crescent moon. These are pretty much the symbols of the Virgin of Guadalupe. We also see the dove of the Holy Spirit over her head, um, but the and an eagle perched on a cactus. Again, the symbol that we see on the Mexican flag. We just saw it in the Codex Mendoza. Uh, we saw the prickly pear cactus in the Velasco painting. So these symbols are things that are constantly uh, carrying through uh, in these works for created for Mexican identity. So she becomes a very important saint. Uh, for the Americas. She is considered the patron saint of the Americas, the patron saint of indigenous people. Uh, with the enclenchado technique, we have these tiny fragments of mother of pearl placed into this wooden support or canvas, uh, covering them with a yellowish tint, some thin glazes. This technique rooted in indigenous traditions. Uh, and that's one of the things that, you know, I kind of want to reinforce is that when the Spanish come, there is mixing of techniques and there's mixing of subject matters and there's mixing of traditions. But the indigenous people aren't, you know, their traditions aren't entirely eradicated. Uh, they are put into different contexts now. And so they are applied differently. Uh, we also have the influences coming out of Asian dec decorative arts. Mexico City is the hub of uh, the Manila Galleon as well as the Spanish Galleon. So the, we have these um, trade fleets going back and forth across the, the Pacific and the Atlantic. And then we also have trade routes going north and south. So lots of influences shown here in this very important subject matter. Uh, she was embraced by the Creole population, uh, those Spanish pe people of Spanish descent born in the Americas and became a rallying cry during the time of the independence movement. Uh, you know, she, became, she was a major symbol of Mexican identity and it still is today. Now, other things we talk about in this contact zone of Mexico City, uh, the Spanish have an obsession with racial purity in these highly racialized societies that they have both in the European continent and their colonies. Uh, in the 18th century Mexico, this gives birth to casta paintings or cast works. Uh, so they are known as... Um, there, there's a large body of these works predominantly produced in New Spain, uh, this area, of course, uh, where we have enslaved Africans, meaning indigenous cultures, meaning uh, Europeans, um, and then, of course, we have people coming from Asia as well into Mexico City. Uh, and so the casta, the Spanish word for caste, refers to these uh, the, the hierarchical system of race that they construct, and there are 16. And most of these uh, of these 16 racial pairings and, and their offspring are shown in groups of three or four to mirror images of the Holy Family. Uh, and the, the placement of your of where you were in the caste system, uh, generally the higher up you were, the more superior you were, and the more indigenous, or, or the less indigenous, less uh, African you were, and certainly the more European. So the more Spanish you were, that pretty much put you at the top of the pecking order. These also came with phrases um, that told you exactly what racial mixing was going on here. So one, we have the Espanol India produce mestizo. So a Spaniard and an Indian produce a mestizo. And, and so they actually give names to these races. Uh, and so sometimes all 16 castas are in one image. Sometimes they are in separate canvases, uh, like what we see with the works of Juan Rodriguez Water. Juan what Rodriguez Juarez. Uh, and these works uh, have all sorts of fanciful terms, the torna atrás, the turn back, uh, the tente en el aire, uh, all of these like dealing with um, the percentage of your ancestry that's an indigenous or African uh, and, and what that means for your skin color. Uh, they even will use uh, certain animal terms uh, for figures of the lower castas. Uh, so it's it's not um, it's not a pretty thing that's going on with these uh, as far as racialized uh, typing, but it is something that the Spanish are doing to try to put everything in order, uh, given all of the very highly fluid mixing that's going on in this contact zone. So these are often created, uh, we think, to, for audiences 
overseas. So to send, you know, there's probably 2000 of these casta paintings that have been made in the 18th century. And they are predominantly 18th century works. They're kind of a unique phenomenon to this period of time. They probably we think went to colonial officials, European officials, ecclesiastical authorities, some enlightenment thinkers, naturalists. They probably went into some of the cabinets of natural history or curiosities that were being collected, uh, again, as this kind of attempt to understand the inter-ethnic mixing that was going on, uh, trying to determine which elites, uh, which were actually of pure blood. Uh, and so among these works, a lot of uh, you know, stereotyping here in the work you have, um, you see the mother in her uh, Spanish elite or her indigenous elite garments in her wheat bill and the very rich textiles. We see the Spanish father in his uh, European dress. Uh, we see the children here. Um, this child has a small object on her shoulder called a relicario, which indicates that she is of Spanish uh, blood. And so all of these things um, would Maybe for us today, we need to do a little research to understand all the symbols of the dress and the arrangements, but they would have been read by the audiences of the time period as uh, easily understood and, and under, you know, kind of establishing that pecking order. So lots of things to talk about again when we talk about visual and contextual analysis. This context of the contact zone is exceptionally important. Uh, even though all of these are ethnographic fallacies, these are just kind of made up um ideas that they had uh they took them very seriously and the and the idea of blood quantum was something that was a discourse happening in this contact zone region now i'm gonna bring in this work las meninas uh just to kind of touch base with it to make sure you understand that spanish colonization yes the spanish come in they take over this region but influence from the Americas does make it back uh, to Europe. It's not a one-way street when we talk about um, kind of this uh, influence of cultures. So in Las Meninas, which uh, you have in your image set, I wanna draw your attention to this little detail right here where uh, the Infanta is being handed something to drink, probably hot chocolate, which would have come from the Americas, in a little vessel called a bucaro, which was an American style uh, ceramic vessel, uh, painted in a red glaze made from likely the cochineal bug, which grew on the prickly pear cactus. Uh, that was something that uh, the Spaniards were harvesting and kind of got the lockdown on red dyes for a while because they had um, access to these cochineal bugs that you actually squish them and you make red pigment, uh, served on a silver tray, which would have come out of the mines of Potosi. So there are objects in some of these European works that show this kind of global trade network that's going on for the Spanish. Um, the practice of drinking hot chocolate, the bucaro, the red dye, the silver tray, all of these things we see in not only these works, but in Vanitas still lifes and in other uh, wealthy settings of European elites. So let's practice for homework, doing a little analysis of a work from a colonial Latin American contact zone. And this is the work I want you to work with. Now, this is a slightly different view from what you have in your image set, but it is number 159 and it is in unit five, um, the Church of Santo Domingo. And what I'd like for you to do is describe two aspects of the original historical or religious context and or um, usually means or use specific visual evidence to explain one way the site speaks to its indigenous roots. So tell me one of the visual elements that speaks to indigenous roots. Uh, a visual evidence to show how it speaks to these European traditions that have come in. And then use contextual evidence to explain how this structure elicited a response in the contact zone of the colonial Andes. Who would have, you know, how would an indigenous audience respond to this? How would a European audience respond to this and, and what's going on here? So I want you to do a little uh, think, put on your thinking caps, kind of think of some of the things we talked about today uh, and uh, write up a response and send it to me using the Google form at the link below. So quickly, what should we take away? 
Visual analysis skills, again, we identify work, we describe visual elements uh, that are used to create it, we explain artistic decisions about uh, the work and how that shapes what we see. Uh, contextual analysis, we're placing it in a context for how it was received, how it was created, uh, what was going historically, politically, socially, is this a clashing of cultures, uh, you know, what's happening there, how does that all influence the overall uh, work of art. Different details are going to help us understand this and what's happening in the original time period. Again, what events are happening, what cultures are in play, how are they interacting, what's the power st structure, uh, how does that impact what we see. And so you guys use both visual and contextual analysis skills in multiple choice questions. You're going to use it in free response questions. You know, for the long essay, you're going to have to find evidence of visual um, or visual evidence or contextual evidence to, to support your thesis and claim statements. So again, these are the skills one and two because they are the building blocks. They are things that we use throughout the course, throughout the exam to do art historical analysis. Okay, so one more time before we go, here is the longer link to the Google Drive, to the Google Form. Uh, so please uh, get in touch with me if you have any more feedback, if you still have questions. Don't forget to visit that link about the exam that could maybe help resolve some things uh, that kind of keep popping up in the feedback. Uh, if, in case you have questions about the digital format, it really lays it out pretty clearly for you there as well. Um, so take a peek if, for my digital test takers. And that's pretty much all for session three. Uh, tomorrow night, we're going to do attribution, which is a super fun, uh, fun skill. That's my favorite kind of question. Somebody asked me that in the feedback, what's your favorite type of question? I love attribution because as a kid, I wanted to be uh, Nancy Drew and I like to solve mysteries. And to me, an attribution is uh, kind of piecing together the mystery of an unknown work. So for tonight, I will sign off. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, study hard, uh, and good luck out there, art historians. See you soon. <laughs>